And there's some unopened wooden boxes there. Yeah. Unopened. Brand new. Air from 1980s. So there's the jail cells through here, but then in here is the interrogation room. We're about to go to the rooftop of one of the highest apartment buildings in Chernobyl. Literal records on a record player. I would go ahead and say this is one of the creepiest places I've ever been. There's so many books that they're spewing out of the window. Just imagine that this control center was one of the most top secret places in the Soviet Union. I cannot imagine how they make babies to wear gas mask. There's a moose. A moose right here by the building. In this video, we will be entering the Chernobyl exclusion zone. But firstly, let's go back 35 years. There has been a nuclear accident in the Soviet Union and the Soviets have admitted that it happened. An official announcement from the Council of Ministers. There has been an accident at the Chernobyl atomic power station. The Soviets may have been fairly quick to acknowledge the accident because evidence in the form of mild nuclear radiation had already reached beyond the Soviet borders to Scandinavia. The civilian plant in question is in the Ukraine. It's near the city of Kiev, population 2.5 million, and about a thousand miles from Scandinavia, meaning that whatever did occur there, a radioactive cloud headed north across Poland today and into Denmark, where radiation levels were five times normal and Sweden illegally high. On April 26, 1986, at approximately 1.23 in the morning, a late night safety test that went horribly wrong in reactor four of the Chernobyl nuclear power plant caused catastrophic consequences. This is my second time to Chernobyl, but in this video series, we will be going deeper into the Chernobyl exclusion zone, exploring Pripyat, the abandoned city that used to inhabit 50,000 people, and even out to a remote village that used to have a population of 600 people, but now has a population of only one behind a wall of military and police checkpoints to access the exclusion zone it's almost like accessing another country multiple checkpoints passports and essentially visas are checked hospitals kindergartens high schools morgues churches all abandoned and all left as they were on that fateful day and remember the people of the Chernobyl exclusion zone only had a few hours to evacuate told that they would be returning in a few days time but of course they never returned they were told to only bring the bare essentials. Many of their belongings are sitting exactly where they were left 35 years ago. So this massive building, 16 stories high, I'm gonna head to the very rooftop. A strange feeling being in these buildings by yourself. Reactor over there in the distance. So you imagine when the explosion happened, people coming out of their balconies to see what's going on. And over there in the distance, they see the explosion. We're about to go to the rooftop of one of the highest apartment buildings in Chernobyl. Unbelievable. Absolutely incredible. I think up here is where you really get a feeling for the place. It's, it's quite moving to be honest. I mean, I see no one. To me, what point is especially brought home being up here and you know, just generally being in the Chernobyl exclusion zone is how, how life is quite fragile, you know, and, and you never know when things can just be instantly changed at the drop of a hat. One day you wake up and you're told you got to leave, you'll be back in four days, but uh, you were actually never able to return. And It's an incredible reminder of, of life and, and, and the things that we need to be putting the most importance into. Family, friends, money comes and goes, right? But uh, it's the people that you have around you that that really matter see the ferris wheel there remember that was never used it was built just before the explosion happened and it was supposed to open a few days after but it was never used it 
used to be actually in Kandia Garden, but uh, after the accident it was in use as a laboratory. They brought samples of soil and herbs from all over the zone in, and stored it and tested it. And when was this abandoned? In uh, late 1990s, I guess in 1999. Over here we have the, the babies' gas masks. Just in case the Americans bombed, they could put these on babies. How sick is that? Old documents here. Wow, this room is just coated in moss on the floor. Some samples, some different kind of dirts there so they can test the radiation levels. So in this room is all soil samples here. And over here you've got the name of the village here. And then you've got the, the date that the sample was taken. So that one's 96, 1993. So if we test, this one is apparently reasonably low. So if you test the soil sample here, so that's 0.73. A natural level in Europe and the United States is 0.3. Even that, no, that 0.8, it's still not anything, you know, crazy. This is one where it's written that it's a bit more dangerous, a bit higher levels of, of radiation here. So you can see that steadily going up, 1.5. So yeah, again, that's that's not crazy, not great, not terrible. If you're worried or you think it might be, you know, foolish to come into these places with, you know, these levels of radiation, keep in mind that uh, if you were to fly to America for 12 hours or so, your total dose would be 22. So this is 0 0.3, your total dose would be 22. The difference though is here you're more at risk at maybe inhaling, ingesting or, or touching particles where then you're in a plane. That's not possible. These are children's lockers from when it was a kindergarten. They've been turned sideways and used as, you know, storage. The ground is just absolutely littered with these bottles. I mean, testing like uh, grass. They've even got samples of well water in here. So we just come into a, a school from age 7 till 17 and uh, we're in the, the gym here and look at the floor. Basketball hoop, basketball's still here, gas mask of course. Old record, vinyl record there. So here's one of the classrooms here and you've got the, the desks, double desk, two people at a desk. Something quite interesting here is, this is the, the young pioneers. I was in North Korea several years ago. This still happens in North Korea, so they dress up as young pioneers and work their way all the way up to communists, but they start them young. Even the clothing's the same in, in North Korea today. They're still doing this in North Korea with the, the red scarves and everything. There's huge similarities between, you know, these buildings and what I saw in North Korea. Same colors, you know, those old Soviet colors, same classrooms, same school uniforms. Uh, obviously the Soviet Union expanded far and wide. Even the metro stations are the same in North Korea as they are here in Kiev, Ukraine. So there's a book actually here in English, a picture of Lenin, Lenin's childhood and school days. His mother spoke French, German and English and a very good pianist. I mean, this is really quite profound. And, you know, most of the scripts and, and everything here is in Cyrillic. So up here you would have noticed, you know, all over this trip in Chernobyl you see gas masks, you know, in many different buildings, especially schools and things. And here's the instructional instructions on how to put the gas, gas masks on, hook them up to the filter uh, at school, at home, at the dinner table up top with granddad, mum and dad. And uh, then here even it says bomb shelters, so all the, the kids running to the bomb shelters, which doubled as metro stations. I'm standing on books. This is the library. Okay. Have a book there, but this, I'm, you know, I'm hip height. I'm standing on books. One about geography. Africa, Australia. Incredible geography. Pictures, color, Antarctica. There's so many books that they're spewing out of the window. I don't know if you can see the scale, but. I'm, you know, this is a high roof and I'm standing on books. 
Unbelievable. English textbook. Teaching English, look. I want to go to the cinema. Do I want to read a book? No, you don't. Do you want to go to the cinema? Yes, you do. Here's music class, smashed up piano, more seats. Literal records on a record player. Sports, you've got your weightlifting, you've got uh, archery, and then of course you've got your, your pistol <laughs> training. I believe this is something along the lines of sport down there, and higher, faster, stronger, something like that. One thing that really strikes you about this place is definitely how quiet it is. You know, this is the, the main square of a city that used to have a population of 50,000 people. This is the, the exact center of the city, and now you can see nothing, just birds. At the school here, there's a shooting range, and you have to learn how to use a Kalashnikov in your last years of high school, yeah. right? Yeah. Can you just talk about how that was for you growing up? So, boys, we taught how to use Kalashnikov, how to disassemble it to assemble it and how to shoot. We were taken to shooting ranges. So many Soviet schools uh, had a shooting range next door. Boys in last grades so were taught how to use weapons, Kalashnikov. So these are gas masks obviously for children because they're very small, right? So these gas masks weren't actually for the, in case the power plant had an issue. They were in case the Americans dropped a nuclear bomb. So this is inside the shooting range here for the, the kids of this high school. Oh wow. The ground is just absolutely covered in masks. And there's some unopened wooden boxes there, and they must be full of more masks. It's, uh, unopened. Oh, no. No, yes, this is the bag for this. Brand new. Yeah. Air from 1980s. And you must open this one, of course. And you were taught how to use these in high school? Yes. But were these used during the explosion at all? No. No, no they no, weren't? No. I cannot imagine how they make babies to wear gas mask. School students, maybe. But how about babies in kindergarten? So this is people's grades. Names of uh, students. students in alphabet order. Subject, uh, Russian language. Mm -hmm. 26 is a day of month, and month number four. When you were at school, were you scared of, of an attack from the United States? You weren't uh, scared? Uh, personally, me. I expected it in any moment. You did? Uh, yes. I, I remember one of the night, I woke up sweating, you know, <laughs> because uh, it seemed to me, you know, nuclear explosion everywhere, you know, I was very scared. So Igor was just telling me that the most action that these filters got was uh, for students in the dormitories. It was uh, not allowed to smoke. So what they would do is they would take off the, uh, the bottom cap here, uh, suck in a, a puff of the smoke and then blow it through the filter and then the administration ladies wouldn't be able to smell the smoke. The whole corner of this school here is completely collapsing into itself. Have a look. Just the weather and then the nature is just completely bringing all the buildings down. We were happy to live in Soviet Union because we were taught we must be happy to live in Soviet Union because if you live in other country it's bad. So we just come through the trees and we've arrived at a kindergarten. Kids lockers. The dog is pulling the pillars. What? Look at all the, the cots, the babies' beds. No way. This is a bit much. I would go ahead and say this is one of the creepiest places I've ever been. Toy kitchen. 
this corridor just goes way down. This building is huge. This is a huge kindergarten. When you hear a noise, you just get a huge fright. Just imagine a city of 50,000 people abandoned. I mean, I grew up in a city of less than 10,000. Quite hard to comprehend, really. Pretty unbelievable, the quality of these pictures. The condition of them. And there's an overwhelming amount of doll's heads. Board games. I mean, to me, it's quite amazing the condition that these are in. Shoe. Oh, wow. And there he is, the father of the Soviet Union in the kindergarten. Piano there. To get offered a job here, was it like something like, wow, you've, you've achieved something if you've got a job in, in Pripyat? It was a, a dream place. A dream. A dream, yeah. a dream place. It's a absolutely new town, brand new, super perfect infrastructure. We have come to what is known as the Woodpecker, which was actually a, a Soviet spy base, which was top secret, but now it's just left here abandoned. So we're gonna go have a look around here today and go into some of the control rooms and you can see what parts of the world that the Soviets were spying on from this very base. Respect our battle tradition. Careful walking around here, check this out. or I should. Okay, so now I'm entering the control center. Just imagine that this control center was one of the most top secret places in, in, in the Soviet Union in 1986. And now we're inside of it, you know. Really quite dangerous, there's just random holes. This is like something straight out of a James Bond movie. Here we are on the top floor. This is insane. So here's the main control room. You can see the little computers, big screen with all the information on. The technology you have in your smartphone is, you know, considerably more advanced than this whole place. But, you know, back then it was cutting edge technology. So this is something extremely interesting. Remember the big screen I was talking about upstairs? Well, that was full of these, and this is one pixel from back in, you know, the 70s or the 80s. So this is the technology that they had at the time, and that's, that's literally one pixel. So the screen was made up of hundreds of these, but you can imagine the quality wouldn't have been the best, but at the time it would have been, you know, quite mind-blowing. So here are some anti-USA scripts here. Protect against the, in quotes, peacekeepers in Lebanon. Soviet soldiers and American soldiers. The Western weaponry and the Soviet weaponry. Here is a map of American Air Force bases, North Dakota, Montana. Arkansas. This is USA. You try to think back to what it would have been like at the time and it's just really hard to comprehend but also it's such a privilege to be able to to be here in a place that at one time had so much activity uh, you know with such international relevance. So here we have a room full of circuit boards. One of the most fascinating things I think in the whole of you know Chernobyl exclusion zone is right here. This is part of a globe obviously you can see the united kingdom there so this is the area of the world that they could you know spy on and, and monitor from this very base here we have you know soviet union at the time here we have uh, europe again uk scandinavia iceland greenland and then much of the united states here so there were a few of these bases there was another one in far east russia and there was another one in, in southern ukraine and uh, you know they could cover and spy on much of the world from from these bases one of the most top secret places of the soviet union at the time is now just you can see what it's like i 
Are you feeling me? <laughs> or you should me tell me it in advance. I would say quite different, but I, now I'm telling you the secrets, you know. It's not for everyone, you know, it's just for you. Because you're from uh, New Zealand, you're just a friend of Ukraine. <laughs> <laughs> So here we are at the police station. Here's the reception area. This is, I think, a temporary like holding cell here. So there are the jail cells through here, but then in here is the interrogation room. You can see this chair here, bolted to the ground so they can't pick it up and throw it at the interrogator. But insane. Insane. But there's and then you can look through here. <laughs> Food through there. <laughs> he just charged us. <laughs> and there it is. What caused everything that you've seen in this series of Chernobyl. Reactor 4. And that's where I'm going to end the series. Right here. A suitable place, I think. Last time I started here, last series I started here, this time I'm going to end here. Thank you very much for watching this Chernobyl mini series. As you can see, Igor and I had a great time making it. If you want to go to Chernobyl and you want to go with Igor, I highly recommend it if you want a knowledgeable guy that also has a great sense of humor. I'll leave the tour company down below that Igor works with. Not at all sponsored, I paid for the tour, but I really do think that it's a great company. My next videos will be in a few weeks. Sorry for the gap in uploads again. I'm sure you can understand it's not the easiest time to travel with all the restrictions and things, but my next trip is well in its planning stage. It's going to be quite a big trip. It's going to be quite something on the extreme side. Bear with me. I'll be back soon with uh, some new content for you. But in the meantime, look after yourselves and each other. And, and thank you as always for watching. And in case I don't see you, good afternoon, good evening, and good night.